Thank you. Okay. Well, let's get rolling here. Um, the business analysis aspect, uh, I've been working in this field for, oh, many, many years, and uh, it is a real passion of mine. I'll just note um, that if you do want to tweet, my Twitter hashtag is MB, as in Bravo, Borman. So let's look at what we're talking about today. Often there are many myths that we need to debunk, and I'll get started with listing some of those myths, but I imagine that many of those beliefs you may have uh, dealt with yourself. Our real focus today is around the actualities, what in fact is really happening out there with successful Agile teams. I'll cover briefly some of the guidelines that have been identified by the IIBA and the Agile Extension, and then uh, summarize and have plenty of time for questions and answers. So this idea of myths, oh boy. I have to say that uh, many of these business analysis myths that are listed here um, are pretty common and have been for many, many, many years. These are beliefs or practices uh, that have been handed down over time. And some of them, well, maybe some of them are necessary. Say you might need lots of documentation if you're in a regulated environment. But the question I'll address shortly is who is being served by that. So we want to look at these myths and consider what could really be true? What could really make us successful? On the same uh, side of the myths would be about Agile analysis. There is a lot of confusion out there um, about what would be true during an Agile effort. Is the really analysis done? Um, some people would say, no, we don't need analysis. So other folks may look at this list and say, gee, that's my life. That's how my project is operating right now. And I guess I'd ask the question of, well, how's that working for you? Is that a successful way of working? So let's move on to thinking about what are the actualities. Now, I'd like to pause and just share that this is all based on what's coming up in the next few slides would be work that um, is the result of Ellen and me and Sue and some other folks at EBG Consulting and based on our work, mentoring teams, consulting, and doing training, that we found that these are ways for teams to be more effective, to be more agile. And this is really the basis for the book that Ellen and I are writing. Um, obviously, I can't go into a lot of detail in one hour. Um, I'm going to explore these five concepts with you, and um, we'll actually be able to talk at the end about how in detail um, these would actually be realized. So first of all, these five we consider hallmarks of successful Agile efforts. Um, these aren't just possibilities. In fact, this is what we find today. Being able to, number one, deliver a valued product. Um, understand that we need to operate in a partnership mode. Uh, that we need to be careful about when we analyze and discover those needs and making sure that it's just in time. And the thing that some of you may be aware of is what Ellen and I coined the structured conversation, and I'll go into some detail on that. And the last one, number five, very, very vital of confirming what those product needs are before development, during development, and especially after development. So I'll be covering each of these five one by one. So the first one, thinking about developing and uh, delivering a valued product. And the first question is, well, what the heck is a product? The way we frame that is it could be a software application, it could be a system, it could even be a device that contains software. But most importantly, it has to have some value to the users as well as to the business, the business that will develop and will typically sell the product. The business has to receive some benefit from that product as well as the users. So looking at this, we can think about having some way of cataloging or having a queue of unrealized product needs. And this idea of product needs or product options, these are all product possibilities, these big chunky things at the top might be a big feature of some possibility that we discover, we put in the backlog, and it may sit there for some period of time until it's valued and selected to be delivered. 
So big chunky things, small little nuggets of things, this product backlog is very dynamic. It's going to evolve. But what we want to be careful about, very, very careful about, is that this doesn't become a dumping ground. We don't want to have a bloated backlog. We want a lean backlog. We want to limit the number and the age of the items in that backlog. That's true, truly being agile. So the question is, how do we decide what goes in the backlog? Um, do we keep some things out? Are some things not worthy of being in the backlog? And that's where this concept of value comes into play. So when we consider, well, what the heck is value? We have done a lot of research on this, and there's not a lot of clarity um, about value itself. So we certainly can turn to a dictionary and ask, well, what does value mean? And we hear things like, oh, it's the perceived benefit, or it's the fair return in exchange for money, time, goods, and services. Uh, well, that's all well and good, but when I'm trying to analyze a product and a product need, I need something more specific there. So the ability for us to be able to look at this and consider um, number one, a successful product has to deliver value that's aligned with the uh, vision, the goals, and the objectives. And one way of looking at it also is this concept of Erascus, I-R-A-C-I-S. I'll go through these one by one. I-R stands for increasing revenue. So we would gain revenue because people find the product desirable. They'll spend money to be able to buy that product. That certainly is a benefit. Um, another one would be the AC, or avoid cost. And a valuable option might be it enables us to reduce our expenses or it helps us to protect our revenue for the business. And the third one, IS, stands for improved service. So if we have a particular product option that would enable the product to be more usable or have greater speed, that would make it more desirable and certainly a benefit. But the problem is um, it's not all just benefits. It's not all rosy. We have to think about the risks, and we're going to have to balance the benefits against the risks. Now, risk might be... Um, a certain dependency. We're dependent on another team, and they aren't going to be ready when we are. Uh, it might be a risk could be uh, we're dealing with some older technology that we can't replace right now. And another risk might be uh, we're late to the market. Should we even proceed with this? Encom encompassing all of this would be other considerations that would ask, is one option more valuable than another because we have more users that um, the number of users are greater for one option versus another. But ultimately what we're trying to do is to make a decision, a value decision. We need to be able to select the highest value options for that next delivery cycle. The second actuality is something that typically people consider, oh yeah, I understand that, no problem. Um, we're, we have a partnership. But the partnership is just words. It's not actually a true joining together. And we like to think of this as having a way to consider these three, what you call them constituencies, um, looking for ways to have this cross-discipline perspectives, joining together, making those shared participatory decisions. So first of all, we certainly need a customer. And when we think about the partnership, the customer may not always be a vocal customer in the sense of helping us to analyze the product, but they are the people we're focused on because they'll ideally use the product. 